Hello, my name is Jared Skeens and welcome to the Zoom Room. Today we want to look at a past paper, uh, 2020, May, June 2020, paper 12, and, uh, and, look, and work, work through the solutions here to hour and 50 minute test. Uh, you, if you go through it, you should have with you the MF19 uh, formula sheets that are allowed for you to use. Total marks for the paper, 75 points. So here in the first question, we have our binomial expansion. Notice it's looking for the coefficient of x squared. So the first thing that I do is I take my exponent and I break it down in the pos into the possible combinations, 6, 0, 5, 1, 4, 2, 3, 3, 2, 4, 1, 5, and 0, 6. There is an algebraic way of doing it also. If you watch my video on binomial expansion, I show you the algebraic way. Although for me, it's a little faster to just do this little mental thing. And so what we're looking for is the pair that gives us an x squared. So notice in the first term, there is an X in the numerator. And then in the second term, there's an X in the denominator. So this first column of numbers represents the first term and the second column of numbers represents the second term. So if we have a four in the numerator and a two in the denominator, that gives us a total of X squared. So this four two combination is the one that we want. So we start off with the NCR. By the way, the formula for this is in the formula sheet. Although instead of using NCR, the formula sheet uses uh, Pascal's uh, column vector. But uh, 6C2, 6 because it is the total exponent value. And 6 choose 2 because it's the right hand column here, the 2 and that value gives you 15. Then your four and, you, and your two go on your first and second terms. So you have an x to the fourth and you have a negative two over x squared. Don't forget the sign goes with the term and this is being squared, which distributes to the sign as well. So you should end up with a positive four over x squared because exponents distribute to both multiply and divide. Then your x to the fourth and x squared cancel to give you just x squared. And your four times 15 gives you 60. And it's asking for the coefficient, which is just the 60. Then in the second part of the problem, there's another uh, typical example here where it has another binomial in front of the binomial that we just did. And it, we know that this binomial is going to be distributed through all the terms of this sixth power binomial. But we don't need to multiply it by all the terms. We just need to multiply it by uh, the specific term that gives us a combined coefficient of x squared, an x squared term. So a constant 2 needs to be multiplied by an x squared term. And an x squared term needs to be multiplied by a constant. Well, we already found our x squared term back here. It was 60x squared. So that one is already found. But now we need to find the constant. So again, if you come back here up to our list, we need to have the same exponent in the numerator as in the denominator to get a constant. So that would be the 3, 3. The 3, 3 combination does that. So now you have 6C3, which is 20, and then x cubed and a negative over 2x cubed. And so you do the math on those, you get a negative 8 over x cubed. The x cubes cancel and you end up with a negative 160. So now what we want to do is we want to put these pieces together. The constant 2 needs multiplied by our x squared term, which was 60x squared from part A. Then our 3x squared needs to be multiplied by the constant, which is right here, the negative 160. And we're going to add those together because they are like terms. 
So we get 120x squared minus 480x squared, which is a negative 360x squared. And again, notice it's asking for the coefficient. So it's negative 360. Question number two, express the equation three cosine theta equals eight tan theta as a quadratic equation in sine. Well, tangent is sine over cosine. So that's the first uh, identity that we can use to change the tangent function into a function that has sine in it. Then we see that we have a fraction here. So we wanna multiply our entire equation by that common denominator, the cosine theta, to make the fractions cancel out. And so we end up with three cosine squared theta equals eight sine theta. Then we recognize the cosine squared theta as an identity that can be changed into sine, which is one minus sine squared theta, distribute the three, and then rearrange it as a quadratic, like the question asked, a quadratic equation in terms of sine. That's what we have, three sine squared theta plus eight sine theta minus three equals zero. Then it says, hence, find the acute angle in degrees for which three cosine theta equals 10 theta. Well, first let's notice we're dealing with hence which means it's connected back here to this previous. And this three cosine theta equals an eight tan theta is what we started with. We just got done demonstrating that it can be this quadratic. So the hence means we're gonna start with this quadratic and then solve it for theta. Notice it's in degrees. There was no domain statement as far as degrees or radians but they do tell you in degrees in the problem, which is important because you're gonna have to set your calculator to degree mode. So we factor this uh, trinomial, this quadratic factors of three on both sides that subtract to give you an eight. Three times three is nine minus the one is eight. So you get three sine theta minus one sine theta plus three equals zero. That gives you a sine theta equals one third and a sine theta equals negative three. Automatically, you should remember that sine and cosine only alternate between one and negative one. In your, in your trigonometric graphing, the amplitude of sine is just one. So it starts at zero, goes up one, goes down one, goes back and forth between one and negative one. So in other words, sine and cosine cannot be set equal to a value that is greater than one or less than negative one. So we automatically cancel out the sine theta equals negative three. In case you forgot that little piece of information, if you tried to solve it on your calculator, you'd get error message anyway. So you wouldn't get very far. Sine theta equals one third does work. One third is positive sine is positive in the first and the second quadrant. Notice this asks to find the acute angle. So that's gonna be the first quadrant answer, not the second quadrant. So you just do the inverse sine of one third on your calculator, making sure you're in degree mode and you get 19.5 degrees. Don't forget for Cambridge, you go to one decimal point for degrees. Number three, we have a weather balloon in the shape of a sphere being inflated by a pump. The volume of the balloon is increasing at a constant rate of 600 centimeters cubed per second. The balloon was empty at the start of pumping. A, find the radius of the balloon after 30 seconds. Now, actually, I had to think about this part uh, twice. Uh, initially, I uh, already recognized this as a change of rates problem. And so I was initially thinking uh, derivative, but if you pay close attention, it says find the radius after 30 seconds. There's no uh, rate 
being involved here per se, except to find the volume. So we're finding a fixed radius at a fixed point in time. So our constant rate of 600 uh, centimeters cubed per second times 30 seconds means that from the empty point until the 30 second mark, we now have 18,000 cubic centimeters of volume. So that replaces the V and we're solving for the R um, after 30 seconds and notice uh, there is no place in our equation for time, though time was used to find uh, the volume because uh, for that. So we just solve for R, divide by the 4 thirds pi, gives you R cubed, then cube root both sides, cube root both sides, you get R equals 16.257. And to three significant figures, the rate is 16.3. Now we get into the increase rate or rate of increase. Find the rate of increase of the radius after 30 seconds. So now that we're finding a rate of increase, not a fixed value like R, uh, now we do the derivative. So we get dv equals, and then multiply the exponent to the front, cancels the three. So you get four pi r squared, because you subtract one from the exponent. And then dr is your differential for differentiating the radius. And we divide both sides by dt, because it's the change of volume and or the radius with respect to time. Then the dv dt was already given to us back here, the, six, the 600 centimeters cubed per second. So that was the dv dt, and we are solving for the dr dt, and the radius is at this 30 second mark, which is our 16.3, although I used the uh, actually five significant figures. Remember, three significant figures is for your final answer, but in your work, if you're doing work, you want to use minimum of four. I used five significant figures to make sure that my final answer comes out uh, accurate. So you plug in the R uh, that we have, you plug in the DVDT, solve for the DRDT, and you end up with 0.181 centimeters per second is the rate at which the radius is increasing because it's positive as the balloon, balloon is being pumped up. Now on to question number four. The nth term of an arithmetic progression is one half parentheses 3n minus 15. So notice right here, I write down a to the n because it's the nth term. And this is the formula for it, equals one half times 3n minus 15. So that's where I start. I don't do this other stuff yet. I read the second part, find the value of n for which the sum of the first n terms is 84. So I write the second equation down. The second equation is about sum and it's the arithmetic sum. And these formulas, by the way, are in your formula sheet. So make sure you know and are familiar with your formula sheet so that you can go right, right to the formula. And I just wrote it out right here. And I was missing an a to the one because we're solving for n. So I know that n is going to be a variable. I know that the sum to n is 84. But I'm missing the first term and the d, the difference. So over here, since we know how to find a specific term, I want to find the first term. So I plug in a one find out that the first term is negative six. So I can plug that in over here. And then to find the D, I just need to find the second term. So I plug in a two to find the second term. Now that I have the first and second term, I can just subtract second minus first to get me the difference, which is a positive 1.5, or you could have put it as three halves. So I plug that in for the D. Then it's just a matter of algebraic working. 
I multiplied this two in the denominator to the other side, uh, simplified in the parentheses, distributed the n through, and then rearranged it as a quadratic uh, because it has an n squared. And this is how we solve quadratics by uh, putting it in decreasing exponential order set equal to zero. Then what I did is because the 0.5 represents uh, basically like three halves, I multiplied everything by two to get rid of that fraction. I treated it like a fraction. If you were treating it like a decimal, you could just move the decimal point one on each of these. So you would get 15, 135, and 1,680. And, and then if you had done it that way, you would have divided everything by 15. Since I basically multiplied by two to get rid of the 0 0.5, now I'm dividing by three. Either way, you get down to n squared minus 9n minus 112. It did take me a little bit of time to figure out how to factor that 112. It's kind of a big number. So I prime factorized it. Then I realized there's a seven. So I divided it by seven and found out that it's 16. And, and the difference, because it's subtraction here, the difference between 16 and seven is nine. So that works out nice. N minus 16 times N plus seven equals zero. So N equals 16 or N equals a negative seven. Again, you have to think about context. At every point, you need to ask yourself how the algebraic solution relates to the context of the problem. The problem is finding out the number of terms. Well, obviously you can't have a negative number of terms. So this context does not allow for the negative. You should throw that out. You will get a point deducted if you don't. You need to recognize that 16 is the uh, correct and <clears throat> only acceptable answer for this particular question. Moving forward, we have functions. And the function f of x is defined for us as a minus 2x, where a is a constant. And so this first part is actually very straightforward, basic things that, that, that you should be able to do. You have a composite function and you have an inverse function. Express them in terms of a and x, meaning you're not gonna get a numeric answer you're gonna get an algebraic statement with A and X involved. So first let's start with the composite function. F of F of X means that we put F of X inside of F of X. So the F of X is A minus two, and we're gonna put it right back inside of the X uh, place. And so we get A minus two times A minus two X, and then you just simplify it algebraically and you can get negative a plus four x. I moved it around so that the first term is positive and got four x minus a. So that is our uh, composite function. Then it asks for an inverse function. Well, with the inverse function, I just replaced the f of x with y. Then we switch x and y and solve for y. So you switch the x and y, make y the subject, and again, you're just algebraically rearranging it to get y by itself. And you end up with a minus x over two. And I got rid of the y and then wrote it in inverse function notation so that they can see that you recognize your result as the inverse function. So those two are very straightforward, easy four points to get. Then we move on to a function equation we're basically taking the two things that we just found, setting them equal to each other in this equation. And notice it says find x in terms of a. This means we need to make x the subject. So make sure when you get to the end of your solving process that you're solving for x and that everything else will be on the other side. Notice it says find x, that's your subject, and then in terms of A, meaning the other side will have the A in it. So we set the two equal to each other, multiply by two to get rid of the fraction. 
uh, distribute the two through the parentheses and algebraically uh, move the x's to one side, the a's to the other, and you end up with a simplified of x equals a over three, or you could have put one third a. Uh, and so this is our value of x in terms of a. Moving on to question six, the equation of the curve, here we have a quadratic with a two part constant at the end. Notice it says K is a constant. So the X squared has a coefficient of two, the X has a coefficient of K, and then the K minus one both together form that final constant in the quadratic. It says in part A, given that the line Y equals two X plus three is tangent to the curve, find the value of K. Now, hopefully you recognize this as a question from the uh, unit quadratics. And this tangent word is quite commonly used. And it means two things. First of all, it means that the two equations intersect. And it also means that they intersect at one point. So the fact that they intersect means we can set them equal to each other. And then we move, because we're dealing with a quadratic, we move the 2x and the 3 to the other side. So when we subtract the 2x, we need to put it with its place value, its correct term. So the kx minus the 2x, and we factor out the x, gives us a k minus 2 as the coefficient for the x term. And when we subtract the 3 to the other side, it's combined with the constants, and that gives us a k minus 4 for the constant. So now we have our ax squared plus bx plus c format. And the second meaning of tangent is that it, they intersect at one point. So that's where we use the discriminant, because the discriminant has to do with the number of solutions. And we get a b squared minus 4ac equals 0. That's the discriminant that we're using. So remember, greater than 0 is for two solutions. Equal to 0 is for one solution. Less than 0 is for no solutions. So this is the one solution. So here is our b, that's the k minus 2, squared minus 4 times a, which is the 2, times c, which is the k minus 4. So we expand the binomial, make sure that you are not distributing the square, but rather you are expanding it and you get k squared minus 4k plus four. So exponents do not distribute to add or subtract. This is k minus two times k minus two. Then you can distribute and get k squared minus 4k plus four. Then you need to uh, multiply all these together. Be careful because you have this minus in the front that needs to distribute. So basically you have a negative eight times the K minus four, which gives you a negative eight K plus 32 equals zero. Just being careful with your signs is important. Then you put the like terms together and you get K squared minus 12 K plus 36 equals zero. Initially, I thought we we're gonna come up with two values. It's trying to figure out why we throw out one of the values. It does not say that K is positive or negative, it just says it's constant. So I was kind of curious how this was gonna work being a quadratic, we have two answers. But as it turns out, when you factor it, it comes out to be a perfect square. So we do get two answers, but they're identical. So our value for K is six. So this is called a double root, sometimes called an identical root or a repeated root. And uh, it only counts as a uh, one as far as the tangent goes, because both values are six. So k equals six either way. Now we move on. It is now given that k is equal to two. So we don't really have to go all the way back to the beginning. We can uh, go back to um, uh, 
or the curve is. So we do have to go back to the curve. We can't go back here where the curve and the line are combined. It says specifically the curve. So we have to go back to our curve equation. So make sure that you pay attention to which equation it's referring to. Is it the curve, is it the line, or is it the combination of the two? So this is express the occasion, equation of the curve in the form of y equals two x plus a squared plus b. So this is the complete the square uh, format. So we plug the two in for our k and simplify it. So here's our a new quadratic, 2x squared plus 2x plus 1. Now we follow the complete the square steps. The constant at the end does not work, so we move it over. Then we also need to factor out of the front what's common to both terms. There's a 2 common to both, which you should have seen the clue there in the format that they gave to you. You see the 2 out front. So this, this is where you factor the 2 out. Then you find the magic number that will allow us to complete the square. So we take the B, which is a one. Notice this is after factoring. So we take the one, we take divide it by two and we square it. B over two squared is your complete the square formula. It's not in the formula sheet. You're expected to have that always in your head memorized. So b over 2 squared, 1 divided by 2 is 1 half, squared is 1 fourth. Then we need to equalize it. Notice it does not say minus 1 fourth. We have this 2 out in front. This 2 distributes. So this is like 2 1 fourth, or we added 1 fourth twice. So 2 times 1 fourth is 1 half. So we actually need to subtract one half for the equalizing there. And now it's ready for the complete the square. And we get two times x plus one half squared plus one half. And so your a is one half and your b is one half. But it asks us to hence find the vertex of the curve. Remember the vertex is what I use h and k as the variables to represent the vertex. Don't forget the value that is attached to the variable, which it is on the x. You change the sign so it becomes negative one half for the x component. The positive one half is not attached to the y. It has already been separated from the y. And so this stays the same sign, positive one half. So our vertex is negative one half, positive one half. Moving on, we get to this diagram. Again, uh, this is our sector area and arc length uh, part of question type. This part here between A, B, and C, it's a little hard to see on the screen, but it's the shaded area. You can see it's slightly dark in there. And it says in the diagram, OAB is this. OAB is a sector of a circle with O is the center, has a radius of two pi, uh, has an angle, the AOB angle is pi six radians. So make sure if you do any uh, trigonometry on your calculator, you're using radians. The point C is the midpoint of OA, and you can see that they've already divided up the, the radius into the two parts, R and R, to make a total of 2R. And it says show that the exact length of BC is R times the square root of 5 minus 2 root 3. Notice it says exact length. So we can't use decimals. We have to use radicals. Now there's probably, if you look at the work that I did, I kind of felt like I did a lot of work for two points. There might be a faster way of doing this. This is the way that came to my mind. Actually, there was another way that came to my mind, but I chose to do it this way. And to me, the length of work seems more like a three or four point problem. So when I see how much work I did and see it's only two points, 
there might be a faster way. Uh, one way that you could have done it that I chose not to do is you could have used the law of cosines. Here you have a triangle with two sides given and an included angle, meaning you do not have a side and its angle. You have a side R without, without its angle, and you have a side 2R without its angle, and you have the angle pi 6 without its side. So you could use the law of cosines to find the CB, and maybe that would have been the faster way. You might want to try that to see if it saves time and, and space uh, for it. But I chose, I didn't really feel like doing the law of cosines. So what I did is I just dropped an altitude here, made a straight line down from C, made it perpendicular uh, to the base. That way I have a right triangle on both sides. That opens up for you Sokotoa and Pythagorean theorem. So I found the H, uh, which is the, this height here. So sine of pi six equals H over R, the, the opposite over the hypotenuse for this particular triangle. And I solved for H, uh, which is equal to R sine of pi six. Now remember, pi six is your 30 degrees. So this is your special triangle for your 30, 60, 90. Here's the 30 up here. So opposite over hypotenuse would be one half, one half. So even though I think in degrees, uh, pi six is the same thing as 30 degrees. So sine of pi six is one half. So H is equal to one half R. Then I did the same thing using cosine and I just put A for adjacent side. So cosine of pi six is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse A over R. Solve for A. Again, we're using the same special triangle. This time from the 30 degree or from the pi six corner, we're doing adjacent over hypotenuse, which is root three over two. And then now that I have that, notice uh, we want to find this over here. So if this whole base length is 2r and we just found a as root 3 over 2r, then this part over here is 2r minus the root 3 over 2r. So now I have the height, half r, and I have this base on the right and I want to find CB, so I use the Pythagorean theorem, BC squared equals the one half R squared plus the, uh, this over here. I took this and I don't know if I should have or not, but I made a common denominator and got four minus root three over two R squared. That way it made it a little bit, uh, I don't know if it made it easier or not. Distribute the squares here through the, multiplications and you get BC squared equals one fourth R squared plus this one you're going to have to multiply out a little bit you get 16 minus 8 root 3 plus 3 all over 4 R squared simplify that down uh, factor out the R squared and then take the square root of both sides to get BC by itself the R squared in the square root comes out as just R and eventually you can get down to showing that BC is R times the square root of five minus two root three. So like I said, I felt like my work was a little bit more <coughs> than the two points. Uh, maybe the law of cosines might have been faster. You can try and compare the two. Now moving forward. <clears throat> says for part B, find the exact perimeter. So again, you cannot use decimals. We have to use exact values. So perimeter is quite easy for shaded region. Here's the shaded region. So from A to B, B to C, and C back to A. So I wrote it here. I, I did AC plus the arc AB plus the straight line BC. 
we already have AC in the diagram and we already have BC, whether or not you were able to actually show and arrive at the conclusion, uh, it's still given up here in the show part. So you have BC either way uh, from the question or whether you're able to actually solve and prove it. And so the only thing we actually have to solve for is the arc BC. So this one is more what I think of as amount of work for a two point problem. So arc length is r theta. Remember, you're dealing with the radians formula, not the degrees formula. So we get your r, the radius of this sector is 2r. So don't forget, don't just put r. Go back and check from the center to the arc. That radius length is 2r, and then the theta itself is pi sixth, and that reduces down to pi thirds r. Plug it in, and they're all unlike terms. You have a, a rational coefficient on r, you have an irrational coefficient on r, and you have another radical coefficient with the r, and so you just have to keep them all separate. There's not much more you can combine as far as like terms. So you can just leave it like that. You don't really need to factor out the R from it. Just leave it the way it is, that's simplified. Moving on, find the exact area of the shaded region. So the, if we go back and look at our object, we wanna find the area of the shaded region so we want to take the entire sector, okay, the area of the sector, and then we want to subtract the triangle. So sector, the whole piece minus the triangle will give us the shaded region. So that's what, here's my general formula, area of the shaded region equals area of the sector minus the area of the triangle. So let's start with the area of the sector which is the radians formula is one half r squared theta. Again, this is in your formula sheet. These formulas are in your formula sheet. Make sure you are familiar with your formula sheet so that you can refer to it uh, quickly in the middle of the test. So you should already know it's there. So again, the r is 2r. So remember this r at the top is the r in the formula but then you have to go to your diagram and the radius is actually 2r and then your theta is the pi sixth and you simplify all that out and you get pi thirds r squared. Then we need to subtract the area of the triangle. Area of the triangle is just one half the base, the base was 2r times the height, which I had already found in the way that I had solved the first part of the problem so the height was one half r. So I just plug those straight in, one half base times height. We're subtracting the area of the triangle from the area of the sector. And I didn't really know which way that the mark scheme would put the answer. So I just showed several different ways of rearranging the final form. Uh, the first one, I factored out the r squared. And the second one, I also factored out the six so that the fraction was in the front and not in the parentheses. And on the last one, uh, I, I also factored out the R squared, but I left the fractions as separate, not with a common denominator. So as long as you have an equivalent form, uh, it will be accepted. There's, they're all basically the same, same thing. They're equivalent. If you see the OE in the mark scheme, it means or equivalent. Moving on, we get to this question number eight. Here we have this diagram with a curve and a couple of straight lines. And the shaded part is the part in the middle. And the curve equation is y equals 6 over x. It, it gives us the 0.16 and 3.2. And this 0.12 over here says the diagram shows part of the curve y equals 6 over x. The points 1, 6, and 3, 2 lie on the curve. The shaded region is bound by the curve and the lines 
y equals two, which is this horizontal line here, and x equals one, which is this vertical line. Find the volume generated when the shaded region is rotated 360 degrees about the y-axis. So remember when you were dealing with volume of revolution that we're rotating something 360 degrees, we generate a circle. So our general formula is pi r squared, okay? Pi r squared. Now, because, so here you see the pi, the r is the six over y, and you see the squared, okay? That's the basic part. Because we're going around the y-axis, there are two things, two things that we need to change from the normal way of doing the x-axis rotation. The first thing that we need to do is instead of the y being the subject in terms of x, going around the x-axis, now that we're going around the y-axis, we need to make x the subject and put it in terms of y. So this wasn't very difficult to do, just multiply the x over and divide the y. So that was pretty easy. That's the first thing we need to do is rearrange the equation for make x the subject if we're rotating around the y-axis. The second thing that we need to do is we need to find our bounds of integration from the y-axis. We're used to finding it from the x-axis. When we rotate around the x-axis, we would look here and go from one to three. But since we're rotating around the y-axis, make sure your bounds of integration are on the y-axis. So that would be from two, the y value, up to six, from two to six. So that's uh, the things that we changed. So here's our pi, here's our uh, bounds of integration along the y-axis, two to six. Here is the r, which is in terms of y, and it's squared. Now, where does this one come from? Well, if you remember, again, uh, if you need to go back, go back to the video series, go back to volume of revolution, y-axis, and, uh, um, or you can, you can do that to help you with some of this. Uh, and I don't remember which video, if it was the x-axis or the y-axis, maybe I might even go back and make a third video specific for washers, now that I'm seeing that the 2020 syllabus has kind of increased the number of washers type. Now, what do you mean, what do I mean by washers? Well, normally when you make a rotation, you get a circle and, and your circle creates a disc. It's solid all the way through. So if you're if your diagram is right up next to your axis and you rotate it, you're gonna get a solid volume. But if your diagram is away from the axis, doesn't matter whether it's Y or X, when you rotate it, you're gonna have that hollow space in the middle. The solid part is out here. And so you're gonna end up with a hole in the middle. So here, here, if you look at this, if you rotate this around the y-axis, all this middle part is whole, a hole there, and this solid part comes over here and, and creates uh, almost a funnel shape uh, object. So what you need to do is the washer method, a washer is, is like a ring that has a hole in the middle. And so you got it outside with a solid and then in the middle there's a hole and that's what a washer is. So you need to take the outer radius, pi r squared, that would give you everything solid. And then we need to subtract the inner radius because it's hollow, that doesn't count towards the volume. So if you look, if we're rotating around the y-axis, usually I draw in a little, I didn't. Uh, so usually I draw a little circle here showing that I'm rotating around the y-axis. And then sometimes I even draw a bigger circle to show my, my object. So this, this circle here, the curve is the outer radius and this straight vertical line, the x equals one, that's the inner radius. 
So here's the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared. So the volume of the whole thing minus subtracting out that hole in the middle gives us the volume of the object. So now that we have that set up, the pi r squared with the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared, then remember that your steps are to simplify, integrate, evaluate. So first is the simplify. For the simplify, I just uh, carry out the square. Notice the square is on the six over y. I actually technically should have put the six over y in parentheses and that square distributes through the division. The square is not just on the six, it's on this six over y. So I simplify that into 36 over y squared and one just stays as one. And then I simplify again by bringing the variable up from the denominator into the numerator because we're gonna follow our algebraic rule for integration. So these first two steps were uh, simplifying. Then this third step here is the integrate. So to the integrate, you add one, so that gives us the negative one, and then you divide by that number, so that gives us the negative 36. Over here, you add one to an understood zero, so that gives you an exponent of one, and then when you divide by one, you still get negative one for the coefficient. And so notice the integral sign is gone because we have already integrated. Now we need to evaluate. Remember to do top minus bottom. So the six is on top, so we plug that in first. Plug it into these two y uh, variables here. Write that down. Then minus the bottom. So plug in the two into both of those places. Simplify, and we end up with eight pi as our answer. Going forward, a tangent to the curve at a point x is parallel to the line y equals 2x equals y plus 2x equals 0. Show that x lies on the line y equals 2x. Okay, so here we have actually three different things going on. We have a tangent to the curve. We have a parallel line that is parallel to our tangent. And the, the values of the coordinates that we're looking for is also on this separate line y equals 2x. So there's a lot of concepts involved here. Let's go back to the tangent. So remember, a tangent uh, touches the curve at just one point. Now, we don't know where it's tangent at. It doesn't really matter at this point. Just imagine uh, a tangent line touching your curve. And what that means is that the derivative is of the curve is your slope for the tangent line. So I take the derivative of the curve. So first I take the curve, the original equation. I move the variable up into the numerator, uh, making it a negative exponent. That way I can use the derivative rule, the, ex the algebraic derivative rule. And so you get dy dx equals a negative six x to the negative two. This is our slope. But we don't know the point at which we're supposed to evaluate the slope because we're finding that location. So instead, that's where we get the next part. It says that this tangent is parallel to the line, parallel to the line. So uh, here we have here, just a second. Okay, getting back here, we have our derivative, the negative six negative uh, negative 6x to the negative 2. It's parallel to this line. That means the slope is the same. So if we just solve this for y, y equals a negative 2x, then that means the slope is negative 2. That's what this parallel is for. Anytime you see parallel or perpendicular, you should be thinking slope. 
So the slope equation from the derivative is equal to the negative two. That allows us to find the x uh, coordinate and we end up with x being plus or minus root three. Now, notice that actually if you go back to the diagram, you can see that the diagram is only on the positive side. It's not on the negative side. So you don't really need the negative. Uh, I'm just uh, in a habit of putting both until I run into something that makes me throw it out. And I, I didn't go back and look at the graph until later and realized the graph is on the positive side. So obviously it's the positive root three, but I just left the plus or minus for now. It doesn't really affect much anyway. Then plug it into the original equation. That's this one here, the six over X. It's not the parallel line. Your original equation is the curve. And so you plug it into six over X. And if you rationalize the denominator, multiply top and bottom by root three, you get six root three over three, which simplifies to a plus or minus two root three. And when you plug your plus or minus root three into this, it says show that it lies on the line y equals two x. If you plug it into the y equals two, uh, in the y equals two x, you get also get y equals plus or minus two root three. So if you plug into the y equals two x, and if you plug into the curve, you get the same y value for the same x, then that means that this point that was on the curve is also on the line y equals two x. So you need to kind of, because it says show, you need to show that that coordinate satisfies both the curve and that y equals two x uh, line. And, and so that's then therefore it, it works. Moving on to number nine, functions f and g are such that f of x equals two minus three sine two x. So here we have functions with trigonometry. And then we have a g of x is equal to a negative two times the f of x function and it gives domain statements. State the ranges of f and g. Now you need to remember that range is a little different in uh, uh, the concept is the same, but algebraically uh, you normally think of range like with a quadratic. And so you find the vertex and you say y is greater than that value or if it's facing down, you find the vertex and y is less than that value, the function. When you're dealing with trigonometry, you need to think of the graph of the function. So just the, the basic uh, graph equation. Again, you can go back to that video on trigonometric graphing to get that equation. It's the y equals a plus or minus b trig function, c, and then your theta plus or minus d. And so what we're looking for specifically when we're dealing with range is first of all, the center line is the two. And second of all, the amplitude. So we're starting, our graph is starting at two and it goes up three and down three, the amplitude up three and down three from the two. So that's what I have here. Two plus or minus three gives us a five if you add them and a negative one when you subtract. So our function f of x, this is the same thing as saying y, Remember, domain is for the variable x, range is for the variable y. Uh, so your range is going to be between 5 and negative 1. Same thing with the function of g, except you first need to multiply the function of uh, f by negative 2. So that gives you a negative 4 plus 6 and then sine 2x. Notice that negative 2 does not get multiplied into the argument of the trig function. This is 
why it's called a transcendental function. Your, your algebra uh, does not go back and forth into and out of transcendental functions until you get rid of that transcendental function first. So that negative two does not get multiplied into the sine two X, but it does multiply the coefficient. Um, so this is what we get. And so now the center line is a negative four and the amplitude is six. So we do the same thing, negative four plus or minus six, which gives us two and negative 10. So the G of X function is between two and negative 10. This is how you write the range. This is not range as in taking five minus negative one and saying how far it is in between. It's wanting you to make a range like this domain statement up here between zero and pi, between negative one and five, between negative 10 and two. Now we get to the diagram. It shows the diagram of the F function. Notice it was a negative. That's why it's going down first and then up because of the negative. So here is the center line. We know that the center line right here is at two. We know that the amplitude was three. So that goes up to five for here, down to negative one for this one right here from zero to pi. So right here at the flex point between the concave up and the concave down, that is our pi halves the midpoint of our x-axis there. And it wants us to graph, sketch the diagram of g of x. So remember the center line of g of x is negative four. So that's down here. And the amplitude was six. So from negative four is gonna go all the way up to the two. We already have that dotted line going across. And it's gonna go all the way down to negative 10. And notice now that your G function is positive. So it starts going up from the center line, concave down, back to the midpoint, the pi halves, then concave up all the way over to pi. So marking those key values through there helps you to draw the curve. Then moving on uh, to the H function, and at first, I, I was looking at this when I first saw this. So the H function is the G function with X plus pi. <coughs> the G function with X plus pi. At first, that's what I was looking at with respect to part C and the transformations and I, I was looking at the relationship between H and G, but when you read it out, it says describe fully a sequence of transformations, plural, that maps the curve of what, uh, F of X onto H of X. So we need to make the connection from F all the way to H, not just from H to G or G to H. So if we, Remember that G was a negative two times the function of F. We can break this down into three parts here. There's three changes from our F function to the H function. First, there's the negative. Second, there's the coefficient of two. And third, there's the plus pi. So you can just line them right up there in order. Uh, the, uh, with a, the negative notice is outside the F function, means it actually belongs to the Y variable, meaning this is a vertical transformation. The two is also outside of the F function, which means it belongs to the Y variable. So this is also a vertical transformation. However, the plus pi is inside the F function connected to the X. So this is a horizontal uh, transformation. So we actually have three transformations that we're doing here. 
Again, you can go back to the video on transformations and uh, uh, watch the, the video uh, for that in underneath the functions, the unit on functions. And when you have a vertical and a horizontal together, it doesn't matter the order. If you have two horizontals or two verticals together, it does matter the order. However, in this case, both the negative and the two are multiplying the F function. So it's not like you have a multiplication and an addition. So that order doesn't particularly apply here because both of our vertical transformations are multiplication. They're the same, same level. So I did the negative first. <clears throat> the negative on the Y means you have a reflection over the X axis. That's the first transformation. The second transformation is the two. So we have a stretch factor of two. Notice your original y, uh, the f of x is being multiplied by two so that your new y is twice the old y. So you have a stretch factor of two in the y axis direction. Then last of all, we have this plus pi it's connected to the X. That means you need to, it's a translation. It shifts the graph left and right. And in this case, it's gonna shift it left. Remember if it's attached to the variable, you need to do the opposite sign. So the opposite of plus pi is minus pi. So I just showed it as a translation and I used a column vector. Remember in a column vector, X is on top and Y is on the bottom. Now, if you look at the mark scheme, it actually put the zero on top and the negative pi on the bottom, but I believe that that is incorrect. Uh, when you're using a column vector, the X value goes on top and the Y value on the bottom. So it should be a translation where you shift it left pi units, and then your up and down is zero. So I believe this is the correct way. I think the mark scheme just has an error in the mark scheme on how they show it. So it's a translation with a negative pi over zero. So this was all new material in the new 2020 syllabus cycle. Uh, these transformations as part of the new uh, part of the new syllabus. And then we move on to number 10. The equation of a curve is y equals 54x minus parentheses 2x minus 7 cubed. And A, find the first derivative and the second derivative. dy dx is the first derivative and d squared y over dx squared is the second derivative. So this is just following the formula. By the way, the formula is in your formula sheet also, although the formula that they show is only the basic formula. It doesn't really show the expanded uh, uh, part. So when you derive 54x, you just get 54. When you derive this expanded part, you multiply the three to the front. You subtract one on the exponent that gives you two. Then because this is expanded here with the parentheses, you need to remember to do the derivative of the inside and multiply that also. So that's a times two. So then I simplify that out, 54 minus six times the two X minus seven squared. That's the first derivative. Then you move forward from uh, that one to do the second derivative. The derivative of the constant 54 disappears. It becomes zero. Then the two times negative six is negative 12 subtract one from the square to give you one for the exponent. And then again, it's still expanded. So you need to multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is a times two. And then I simplified that and got a negative 24 times two X minus seven. If you wanted to, you could have even distributed that through the parentheses, but I left it like this. Then find the coordinates, notice coordinates plural 
of each singular of the stationary points on the curve. So the stationary points is plural, meaning we're gonna have more than one. And we need to find the coordinates, plural, for each of those. It means it wants both the X and the Y coordinate. So please be careful to that. Sometimes they only want the X coordinate and usually the instructions will say, find the X coordinates of the stationary points. But in this case, it says find the coordinates plural of each singular of the stationary points, plural, okay? So what does that mean? Well, stationary point is where your slope is equal to zero. It's where a maximum or a minimum is located. And so the tangent line has a zero slope. So what we do is we take the first derivative, which I just borrowed from up here that we just did. First derivative, set it equal to zero because the slope is equal to zero at a stationary point. Remember your tangent to a maximum or a minimum. And then we simply solve that for x. So move the 54 to the other side, divide by six, square root. Square root gives you plus and minus. Don't forget to add your plus and minus. And so that gives you your two x coordinates for the uh, stationary points. We now need to find the y uh, corresponding part. So when you're finding coordinates, you plug it into the original. So we need to go back here to the original equation, plug your two in, plug your five in. I just did it straight in the calculator, so I don't really show the work. So y evaluated at two comes out to 135. y evaluated at five comes out to 243. So here are our two coordinates, two 135 and five 243. That's our answer for that. Then determine the nature of each of the stationary point. So to determine the nature, I use the second derivative test. There is a first derivative test, uh, but I generally use the second derivative test if the algebra is easy. Besides, we already found the second derivative up here anyway. So uh, that's the easier one to use in this particular situation. So you plug in the two into the second derivative. Again, that was the this one right here, plug the two in, plug the five in, and we get for the two, we get 72, which is a positive value. It is greater than zero or positive, meaning it is a minimum. Here we have plug in a five, we get a negative 72, which is less than zero. Or in other words, it's negative frowny face, which means we have a maximum for the five, 243, a minimum for the two, 135. Then moving on, we get to, uh, again, new uh, material in the new 2020 syllabus cycle. And that is uh, information regarding circles. So again, you can go back to the circle video in uh, coordinate geometry unit and, and review that if you need to. So the equation of a circle with center C is, uh, x squared plus y squared minus ax plus 4y minus 5 equals 0. This is your general form where everything is out by uh, basically exponent order and in alphabetical order and exponent order. Then it says, find the radius of the circle and the coordinates of the center. So that means we want to change it from its general form into its uh, formula equation for a circle. So we need to complete the square twice. We need to complete the square for the x values and we need to complete the square for the y values. Again, the five, we just move to the other side, the constant there, we move to the other side of the equation. We separate our x's together and our y's together. Then we complete the square, so the b which is the eight divided by two is four squared is 16. So since we have an equation, we can add the same thing to both sides. So instead of equalizing it by doing plus 16 minus 16 on the same side, 
we can also equalize it by doing plus 16 on both sides of the equal sign. So that equal sign is our like teeter-totter place where we want to uh, balance uh, the sides. So the plus 16 over here. And then when we complete the square with the y's, the b term is the four divided by two is two squared is four. So b over two squared is four, add four on the left, add four on the right. Then you can create your uh, perfect square. So you get x minus four squared plus y plus two squared and the right simplifies down to 25. So the center is at positive four. Notice it's connected to the variable. So you change the sign. The y part is also connected to the variable. So you need to change the sign for both of them. Okay, that's a little different from the parabola where the x is connected but the y number is not connected. So you change the x, but you don't change the y in the parabola. So with the circle, both numbers are attached to their variables. So you need to change both signs. So it becomes a positive four and a negative two. And then remember that the 25 represents r squared. So the r is just five, the radius is five. Moving down to part B, it says the point P with the coordinates one, two lies on the circle. Show that the equation of the tangent of the circle at P is four Y equals three X plus five. Okay, so if you have a tangent to a circle, then that means your tangent is perpendicular to the radius of the circle doesn't matter where you go around your circle, your tangent line to any point at the circle is gonna be perpendicular to the radius. So the radius is from the center out to the tangent point. Well, our tangent point is point P and the center is four negative two. So let's find the slope from C to P, that's the radius. So y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, we get a slope of a negative four thirds. The tangent is gonna be perpendicular to that. So the perpendicular slope is three fourths. So we can just plug that right into our y equals mx plus c. Then we use the point that is on the tangent line that is the one, two, do not plug in the center. It is not on the tangent, it's on the radius. Uh, but the point P is on the tangent. And so you plug in the one for the X, two for the Y, solve for C, you get C equals five fourths. So you get Y equals three fourths X plus five fourths. Now I use the slope, uh, the slope intercept form you could have also used the point slope form. Uh, either way, after you're done with either slope intercept form or point slope form, then just rearrange it to show that you get the equation that they've given here, four y equals three x plus five. All I have to do is multiply everything by four and you get the four y equals three x plus five. Moving on here, we have the point Q also lies on the circle and PQ is parallel to the X axis. So here you have a circle, you have point P, point Q and the line between P and Q is parallel to the X axis. Well, that means one, that your slope would be zero if you need to work with slope and the text that is between P and Q the second thing that it means is your y value is the same. So we're trying to find q, write down the coordinates of q. And so we don't know its x and y value, but we do know the y value because it is the p and q are both parallel to the x axis, meaning they have the same horizontal level, the same y value. So they both possess the two. Now we just need to find the value for X. Well, now that we have one value, 
Now we can plug Q into our circle equation. Back here, we solved for the equation of the circle. We could plug it in up here as well. Either one will work, it doesn't matter which one. I prefer the circle equation down here as opposed to the general form. So <clears throat> plug this in, you get x minus four squared equals two plus uh, the two, this is your y. Remember this is your y variable here. y plus two squared equals 25. So two plus two is four squared is 16. Subtract that over, that gives you nine. You do not have to expand the x minus four squared because you have a nice perfect square here. You don't have to expand it out and treat it like a quadratic. You can get rid of the exponent by square rooting both sides. So you get x minus four equals plus or minus three. So always keep that in mind. Do you want to expand it or do you want to eliminate the exponent? So x, mi x minus four equals plus or minus three. That means x equals seven or x equals one. Well, we already know that point P has an X value of one. That means the value of Q has to be the seven. So we have P is one, two and Q is seven, two. Now it says the tangent to the circle at P, remember we had a circle with a tangent to our circle at P. <coughs> now we have an, the same circle with the tangent over here at Q. So over here we have the tangent at P and then over here we have a tangent at Q and these two tangents are going to meet. Well, we already found the equation for the tangent of P. So we're gonna use that same method to find the tangent of Q and then we'll find out where they meet. So here's the tangent of P, Y equals three fourths X plus five fourths. We already found that right here. Now we wanna find the tangent at Q. So again, we have to first find the slope from the center to Q, that's the slope of the radius. And we get four thirds for this. So the negative reciprocal, the tangent, because our, our tangent is uh, perpendicular to the radius, perpendicular to the radius of the circle. So the negative reciprocal is negative three fourths, plug that into our y equals mx plus c or into the point slope form if you wanna use point slope form. Then I plugged in seven two, the point q in. Again, don't put in point c, it's gotta be point q is on the tangent line. Plug that in, find c to be 29 fourths. And so we now end up with y equals a negative three fourths x plus 29 fourths. Now we wanna find out where those two tangent lines intersect. That is gonna be at point T. So we set the two equations equal to each other. Now stop for just a second before we solve it. Notice that point P and point Q were on the same horizontal level. They were parallel to the X axis. If you notice the slope, Notice on the one side of our circle, point P, you had a positive slope, positive three fourths. And then at Q, you had a negative slope, negative three fourths, but notice that the slope itself is the same, three fourths. One was positive, one was negative. They're on opposite sides of the circle, but at a parallel level, okay? So just wanted to point that up that out that these so actually instead of doing this work you could have jumped straight to that conclusion but I wanted to demonstrate it first uh, that you could have jumped straight down to here with the y equals negative three four x plus c knowing that it would have the same slope with opposite sign so it could have saved you a little bit of work but I wanted to demonstrate it for you. Anyway, either way, you get these set equal to each other. So get the x's together, get the constants together, solve for x, you get x equals four, plug it into either equation and you get y is 17 fourths. So the coordinates for point T is four and 17 
force, and that takes us to the end of our exam or past paper. Notice again, this is past paper, May, June, 2020 for the Pure Maths 1, paper 12 in our new syllabus cycle here. I hope it's helpful to you. I hope it helps you with your thinking strategies. And let's get out of our sharing here. Thank you for joining me in the Zoom room and hope to see you again sometime.